Welcome to the Real Estate Espresso Podcast, your morning shot of what's new in the world of real estate investing. I'm your host, Victor Manash. This is the weekend edition where we interview notable people from the world of real estate investing. Today is no exception. We've got a great guest all the way from New York City. Welcome to the show, Ryan Severino. Thanks, Victor. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. Great to have you here, Ryan. Now, you work for a major brokerage house, JLL, and you're the chief economist at JLL. What's the career path to being chief economist at a major brokerage house? Well, the first thing you need to do is is not know what you want to do with your life and then try a whole bunch of other things out. And then eventually you just kind of winnow it down. So I think of it almost like a like a funnel. You start at the wide mouth of the funnel and you have a lot of options. You try a bunch of things. Eventually, as you work your way down to the more narrow part of the funnel, start to eliminate some of those other possibilities. You'll eventually realize that this is either for you or it's really not for you. And so I, I spent almost my entire career in commercial real estate at this point. And gradually, I just gravitated toward this because I'm a pretty nerdy academic person. And uh, I just decided to stop swimming upstream at some point. Boy, I've been on the economics and research side for about 19 years of the 23, 24 years I've spent in commercial real estate. If I didn't like it, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. (laughs) I love that. Well, it's an important role because certainly all the major brokerage houses, they have to pay very close attention. All of the business planning is often driven by the analysis that you and your team put together. So that crystal ball is one of the most important tools that they have at their disposal. And lots of us like to play amateur economists, looking at all the various headwinds and tailwinds in the market, try and make sense of it. What are some of the things that you're seeing right now in the current macro picture that most people, in your view, are overlooking? Most people at this juncture accept that the economy is in a good place and will be off and running for a while. Some of the nuance of that gets lost, though. I think there are a lot of popular narratives that are circulating out there that I think a lot of people have latched onto. Uh, I don't mean this to sound disparaging, but we work in an industry where it's very easy to get caught up in groupthink and it's very difficult to be a contrarian, to roughly translate one of my favorite expressions in Japanese, the nail that sticks up gets hammered. And a lot of people don't want to be the nail that sticks up. But I think in my experience in this industry, the people who've done the best are the ones who are not afraid to be that nail and stick up a little bit. The conversation that I've been having with people recently in in that vein is amidst all of the conversation about the economy doing well and what the world looks like on the other side of this, I feel like some of the nuance gets lost in that in the sense that I think a lot of people have bought into this idea that it has been different this time in a sense that the pandemic is really starting to remake the economic landscape and that it's causing these massive migration patterns. It's causing these massive job shifts to different parts of the country. And when I do a a fairly studious dive into the data, you find that's not really the case, that those patterns were there before the pandemic. They haven't accelerated nearly to the extent that I think the media often portrays them. And the reality, I think, is that a lot of market participants are, are missing part of the story. I think that migration story is there and it's been there for a while, but I think they're also missing the story about the big dominant markets. And I know not everybody plays in the big dominant markets. And, and I know that is often the domain of big institutions because of higher barrier to entry price points. But I think that the conversation isn't just about the cities themselves. I think it's about the metropolitan areas, which is really the economic unit of measurement. And the story there is that these places are not imploding, contrary to what you might be reading in the popular business press, that there's not this mass exodus out of those areas and that the commercial real estate that's being left behind is you know, being left for dead and turned into ghost towns. I think we're still working our way through the pandemic. And so we, we, we need to see how some of this plays out. I think that has been oversold on the part of the popular media, potentially overbought by some of the investor community. And I think it's a little bit of a mistake. There is still a lot of activity that happens in those markets that's not not glossing over so easily. I think when people latch onto that narrative, they're looking at cities like New York, like San Francisco, that even going into the pandemic had perhaps a surplus of inventory going in, several years worth of new product supply coming into the market, and then layer on top of that a little bit of an exodus, a little bit of a pause in demand, and then all of a sudden everybody panics. I think there were good good reasons for those dynamics. Right? I think on the supply side, we were starting to finally see some, some inventory increases. And what it did was 
it exacerbated this ongoing rift in those markets between the have and have not buildings. The, the newer, sexier, shiny class AA plus inventory where there really isn't a shortage of demand. And then the 1950s, you know, 1950s vintage on Madison Avenue with terrible visibility and interior columns and not a lot of natural light and these old kind of dingy elevator shafts and things like that. And, and I think this, to, to a, an expression I've used a lot during the last year, I feel like more than being a paradigm shift, this crisis was an accelerant of existing trends. I think there was some of that going on on the supply side. And if you bundle everything together, it sort of looks like that. But when you dig into the data a little bit, you see that there's a very stark contrast between the new buildings that people really prefer to be in and then some of this older inventory that landlords are still trying to figure out what to do with that. On the demand side, I think part of the issue was a lot of these major markets, their populations have largely been driven over, and it's not just the last few years, but really going back the last couple of decades, it's been more of, a, of an external immigration story than a sort of an international immigration story than a domestic immigration story. And I don't want this to sound remotely political because politics is not my thing, but I'll just say that the previous administration was maybe the least favorable toward immigration of all types, legal and illegal, that we've had in a very long time in the United States. And so what really happened was, to a large extent, we turned off the inflow of people into those cities, while at the same time, we didn't really shut off the outflow. That continued. And so as a consequence of that, you had a net population decline. But the point that I always make with people is that unless you think all of the great things about places like New York and San Francisco are suddenly going to go away, all the universities, all the museums, all the bars, all the restaurants, all the other people, the things that have tr attracted people for decades, if not centuries, then there's no reason to think fundamentally that hundreds, thousands of years of urban economic theory is all of a sudden going to start to fail us over the next five to 10 years. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And when we put all of this in perspective, you know, people decry the values. For example, you mentioned Madison Avenue, places in Midtown that used to priced at, you know, five, six, seven thousand dollars a square foot are now sub two thousand dollars a square foot. Well, hello, two thousand dollars a square foot is still a premium price. Right. Anywhere else in the country. And to be fair, there were definitely some landlords who got over their skis last decade with some of that, you know, retail on Fifth Avenue, Madison Avenue pricing like that. And there was a recognition, maybe belatedly on their part, that they were getting excessive about that when you were seeing some of the most stalwart high-end retailers in, in the world balk at, at some of those prices, there was a widening recognition. It's funny because you bring up pricing. The point that I always impress upon people when they start discussing the future of these markets, and I say, look at the pricing side, right? Not during a pandemic, because that tends to distort things, but look over the long run on the pricing side. The fundamental laws of supply and demand still, to my acknowledgement have not and understanding, have not been broken. If pricing is going up over time, it means demand is continuing to exceed supply, or at least for the kinds of space that people prefer. My mother always had it backward. I'm, I'm from New Jersey. I live in, New, in technically in New Jersey. She would make the joke that she, she couldn't understand why anybody could afford to live in New Jersey. It's so expensive. And I said, mom, you have the economics backward. It's expensive because people can't afford to live here. That's kind of how the economics works. And I think the same thing about these markets. In just my lifetime, in the last 40 years, you know, I've heard that these markets have been left for dead by crime in the 70s and into the 80s and then into the 90s, and then by the dot-com bubble bursting, and then by 9-11, and then by the financial crisis, and now this. Yet if you look over time, pricing keeps going up. We can have a good conversation about whether or not those cities and, and areas are managing their housing inventory correctly, which I think is a good conversation for some time. But you don't see prices go up if demand is falling. Like that's just it's certainly not in real estate. That's not how economics works because you'd have to take supply offline. You have to remove inventory from the market. And that's much easier to do when you're manufacturing things than when you're talking about real estate, which is physical space, which is why if you're an economist like me, you see the, the supply curve as being kind of bent. It's straight up at one point, and then it angles upward the way a more traditional supply curve does. Because at a certain point, like you just can't take supply offline unless you're going to take out a wrecking ball and start knocking buildings down. And people are definitely not going to do that during a temporary disruption. Correct. And there's been a lot of discussion about conversion from office to residential. And there's some buildings that lend themselves to that and others that don't. You know, For example, if you look, again, we'll go back to the New York example. The, the pitch between streets as you're heading north-south in Manhattan is about 200 feet. If you've got two buildings on your block, 
you're about 100 foot depth, you can kind of build apartments out of that. But if you've got a floor plate that's 200 by 200, there's just no way you can practically turn that larger floor plate into living rooms and bedrooms. There's too much area in the core for you to turn that into residential. So that will always be an office building. And if it's a 1940s or 1950s vintage building, and it's C-class and it's not A-class and going down the list, that quickly becomes the junk in the market. It becomes the difficult stuff to fill because there's so much new supply that's coming into the market that's much more energy efficient and right all the other benefits. So it's those buildings that I worry about more than anything. That they're eventually going to become blights and you know we'll have to figure out what to do with them. And maybe they'll go into foreclosure and be repurchased or pennies on the dollars and redeveloped. Who knows? Yeah, no, I agree with you. And I think that that is the conversation they think a lot of landlords, even before this crisis in places like Manhattan, were struggling with. I never get the year exactly correctly. And, I, and I'm going to apologize in advance. But I want to say that the median office building in New York was built in like 1957 or 1958, something like that. And there is a lot of not just appreciation on an asset like that over time, but the world evolves. The way that we the, the way that we live, the way that we work, the way that we play is clearly very different 64-ish years down the road. At some point, I agree with you. If that can't be functionally repurposed, then maybe that building needs to be raised and something else needs to be built there. And that's where I'm a believer in the market. The market will figure this out. If the market deems that that Class C building cannot be converted into something easily uh, and it's just not going to be competitive in its current structure, someone enterprising will will figure out the right price point to purchase it, will knock it down, uh, and will eventually turn it into something else. It might not happen tomorrow. It might not happen in five years, especially you know given where sales prices can be even just land prices on a, on, you know, on a per square foot basis in a place like Manhattan. But I, I'm a believer that over time, those things will work themselves out, even if that doesn't transpire immediately. As you look at the demands on your team, on your time, you know, when you're getting direction from your superiors, they're saying, Ryan, we need a report on fill in the blank. What are they asking you for? These days, I think a lot of people are concerned about inflation, whether rightly or wrongly, I would say that there's a lot of chatter about this because on the one hand, I think people are worried about, they're worried about inflation you know, starting to rise up, starting to push interest rates up and having a somewhat deleterious impact on things like the transactions market. On the other hand, I, I think there's, there is a group of people sitting out there thinking, hey, wait a minute, we are talking about an inflate in an asset that is maybe not a perfect inflation hedge, but a somewhat imperfect inflation hedge. That's a story that has kind of, I don't want to say that people have ignored it, but obviously over the last 30 or so years, as structural inflation has gone down over time, the bloom has come off the rose a little bit on the commercial real estate as an inflation hedge thesis. I think some people are trying to dust that off a little bit, and they're wondering if that isn't starting to become a little bit more of an important part of the market. For my money, I think we're somewhere between those ex extremes. I, I think there were a lot of mistakes that led us to inflation in the 70s and the 80s, and I think it's hard to get back there. But I also think that we are due for, and, and I almost think we'll certainly see inflation greater than what we've seen over the last 12 or 13 years. So maybe not catastrophic inflation the way that we saw in the 70s or the into the 80s. We started to get it under control. But at the same time, I think probably greater inflation than a lot of market participants have gotten used to over the last 10, 12 years. And maybe there is a more compelling inflation story that, that can be dusted off a little bit and discussed with clients. And so I, I sort of fall in between those two extremes where it's like, oh, catastrophic inflation, or we're on the verge of becoming Japan. Because I always come back to narratives where we sort of started this discussion. And I sometimes get whiplash from how quickly the narratives in economics and real estate can change. And that's one where I've gotten whiplash from just 12, 13, 14 months ago, maybe, the fear was, oh, we're going to become the new Japan where we can't raise interest rates because we can't push inflation and we're going to be stuck in this liquidity trap environment. To, now we're worried about 1970s <laughs> caliber inflation again. I tend to be pretty, pretty objective and data driven about that stuff. And when I try to peer into the crystal ball, I've been telling people, I think you have a better, better fodder for that argument for inflation than we had once upon a time, you know, the last 10, 15 years. But I don't think we should oversell it to, oh, we're going back to the 1970s, because I think that was the genesis of a lot of 
the interest in commercial real estate, that inflation that ran away in the 70s. That's when you really started to see institutional real estate investing and high net worth investing really start to become a more accepted asset class. And I think a lot of that had to do with the inflation situation back in the 1970s. Well, I think the inflation situation, and I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this, we tend to look to the Federal Reserve as the arbiter of interest rates, as the one who sets the interest rate. But when you start to layer an inflationary narrative on the reality, if you're a lender and you believe that your dollars are worth less a year from now or five years from now than they're worth today, you have no choice but to attach a risk premium to those dollars, irrespective of what the Fed says the rates are. So rates are going up whether the Fed says so or not, if that risk premium gets attached. And I think that's where maybe some of the disconnect lies, is what's going to happen to real interest rates, market interest rates, irrespective of what the Bank of England or the European Central Bank or the Fed says the real interest rate is going to be. The market will ultimately decide, and that risk premium will actually determine the market conditions. Yeah, and that's where I think inflation expectations really matter. It really matters how good of a job the Fed can do with forward guidance and managing forward-looking expectations for that. And I think up until this juncture, the Fed's had pretty good credibility. And if you look toward the shorter end of the curve, if you look at sort of where two-year treasuries have gone versus 10 years, two years not moving very much shows that the market still thinks the Fed has a good amount of credibility. If that starts to falter, then I think there could be issues. But that's, to your point, I think that's why the Fed being more frequent and more transparent about communicating with the market than they they had been throughout a lot of its history. Because I do think managing inflation expectations, to your point, is a big part of it. Because if you are a lender and you're going to have to tie up capital in a, in a commercial mortgage for however long, five, seven, 10 years, you know, whatever kind of rate that you're, you're locking in, even if it's only locked in for a particular part of that period, that still matters to you. And so I think that's where the Fed is not only going to have to manage the economy in that sense correctly, but I think they also have to manage expectations correctly. That, that's always been a risk, but maybe it's a heightened risk today where we have better data, better access to data. We respond to so much stuff on such a very rapid real-time basis relative to what, what the world was like in the 70s and the 80s. I think that's probably the onus on them is greater than I think it probably has ever been to, to manage the message correctly. I love it. Well, Ryan, if folks want to learn more, if they want to connect with some of the research done by your team, what's the best way? The easiest way is probably to go find me on LinkedIn. I'm really not hard to find. Otherwise, it's very easy to search for me and find me on JLL's website and a whole slew of other places that, uh, as my kids now know, you could relatively easily find me for all of the stuff that I've done publicly over the the last few years. But I'd say the most efficient way is probably to connect on LinkedIn. I'm really good about posting. I, I write on a weekly basis. I'm good about posting that. When I do you know, media engagements and things like that, I'm usually pretty good about posting it. It's probably the most efficient way. But simple Google search, as my children have learned, is a pretty quick and easy way to do that as well. Well, fantastic. Well, we'll put all that in the show notes. And so for the listeners at home, definitely reach out to Ryan at JLL.com, the brokerage house, or on LinkedIn. And thank you, Ryan, for the perspective. And in the meantime, have an awesome rest of your weekend. Go make some great things happen. And we'll talk to you again tomorrow.